All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for this Knight Center webinar, Putting People First, A New Approach to Political Coverage. There's a hunger for a different approach to covering elections and politics. It's a big election year in the U.S., but there's also 60 countries around the world holding elections. And we're here to answer some of your questions, provide some resources some trainings. Um, this movement is not new. It's been around for a long time. And we're joined here by some experts and some, some journalists, some professors that have been doing this work for a long time, and they want to share what they have learned to make this process easier for you. Um, and so again, the session's being recorded. You'll get a copy of this recording afterwards. Um, we will um, try to answer as many of your questions as possible. So please put your questions in the chat. Um, and we're here because the conventional approach to covering elections and democracy often focuses too much on polling numbers and what candidates, candidates are saying, and often overlooks the vital concerns of affected communities. And more and more people are recognizing this. And this webinar is a place to share some of the, the strategies and resources and the guides that, that already exist and can help journalists and newsrooms that are trying to embrace a different approach. So we have a excellent panel here, and we're going to talk to each each panelist one on one for about seven minutes, and then we will go directly to um, the audience questions. So I want to start off with um, Jay Rosen, who is a journalism professor at New York University, and he has been um, talking about this, about the need to change um, how the media covers elections for some time now, and he has developed a guide. Um, a step-by-step -step guide for journalists, um, the citizen citizens agenda approach. And so, um, Jay, can you tell us about um, why you why you think? Let's start off by why you think this traditional approach, this horse race coverage approach, needs to change, and what you propose as an alternative. And I'm gonna uh, put up your um, your citizens agenda graphic so people can see what you're talking about as you talk about it. Well, what I'm going to present is a specific way you can get beyond the horse race and put people first uh, in your campaign coverage. Um, I've noticed recently that a handful of news sites are going public with their intention to put the horse race aside and go for something better. And that's what I'm going to try and present something better because you can't replace the horse race with um, something else unless you have an idea of what you're shifting to. So there's about 10 steps in this uh, idea. I'm going to try and present them as uh, quickly as I can. So step one is rather than starting with the candidates or the race or the strategy, you begin with the people you are trying to inform. You identify the people that you reach as an audience, the ones perhaps that you'd like to reach, the people you are doing this for, your community, your public, your crowd. And you have to be realistic uh, about who you can talk to and who you don't reach. Step two is a act of listening. You ask the people you're trying to inform a simple but very powerful question. What do you want the candidates to be talking about as they compete for votes? What do you want the candidates to be talking about as they compete for votes? And step three is repeating step two. In other words, you keep asking that question. What do you want the candidates to be talking about as they compete for votes in as many different ways as possible? You don't ask it just once. You keep asking it online, by phone, in interviews, at events, uh, in an app. Every means we have for reaching people and asking them questions has to be employed. So step three is repeating step two. You need not hundreds of responses, but thousands or in larger metro areas, tens of thousands. Step four is when you're confident in your grasp of what people are telling you, and when you start to hear unmistakable patterns in the responses, you synthesize what you are hearing 
you name and frame it into a kind of priority list, about six to eight items that represent well what you heard when you asked people, what do you want the candidates to be talking about as they compete for votes? And that priority list that comes from the act of listening you started with is a kind of agenda. And that's what we're calling the citizen or some people prefer the voter's agenda, which can be good for uh, metro areas in which citizen is kind of a, a dicey term. Step five is to test the draft agenda with the people you made it for. Once you narrow down what you've heard into six to eight key items or issues, you have to go back to the people that you started with and ask them, does this sound right? So you try to test the draft agenda so that it actually reflects what people in your community have said. That's step five, test. Step six is when it starts to get very real. You publish the agenda as a live product on your site, which means going public with what you heard when you asked your community, that key question, what do you want the candidates to be talking about as they compete for votes? Publishing the agenda means you are saying to your community, this is what we heard when we asked you what you want this campaign to be about. And it also reflects your synthesis of what you heard. It's an editorial product, an editorial decision, uh, and you have to defend it as such. So that's step six you publish the agenda as a live product on your site. In step seven, you now turn that agenda into a template for your campaign coverage. Now that you have this priority list, you know what to ask the candidates about when you have the chance to do that. You know how to direct your reporting. You know what the priorities should be in investigative journalism. And you know what your voters guide should look like and so on, because you've heard from people what they want the campaign to be about. So that's step seven, turn the agenda into a template for your campaign coverage. In step eight, it's a very logical one. You pressure the candidates to address the voters agenda. Instead of the controversy of the day, Instead of the wildest thing uh, crazy politicians said that day, instead of what's drawing um, eyeballs on Fox News, you pressure the candidates to address the voters agenda, which you've been talking about and is a live product on your site. In step nine, you build your voters guide for election day around the citizens agenda and the answers you got when you pressured the candidates to address it. That should be pretty clear, pretty obvious use of the agenda. Step 10 is keep listening and keep sharpening your voters agenda, which is not meant to be a static thing. It Something could happen during the campaign that forces you to alter that list. You may decide you heard it wrong the first time and improve your framing of the agenda. So when I said in step six, you publish the agenda, I meant you listen, you publish, and you keep revising. Um, so that's the citizen's agenda alternative to horse race journalism. You can't beat horse race journalism unless you have something better to put it in its place. And I tried to suggest what that something better is. One more uh, point I wish to make, this idea is old, it's not new. It dates back to 1992, pre-internet, and it's been there for a long time. And we are just now starting to get the kind of rejection of the horse race model that opens the door to something better, which I call the citizen agenda, and you can call anything you want. Thank you so much. And and yes, to answer um, folks' questions from the, the chat, um, the recording and the resources will be sent out to all the participants. Um, so uh, don't worry about that. You will get all these materials um, right in your inbox afterwards. And um, you know, this webinar, this today's webinar is just the first part in this, in this effort. We're gonna be in touch with you. We have an online course through the Knight Center in April that everyone is invited to join. And in fact, if you're 
attending this webinar, you'll be the first to know when registration is opened for that. Um, so thank you, Jay. And I wanted to um, turn to Natalie and the other um, our other panelists today, because um, what Jay's talked about, the Citizens Agenda, um, at Solutions Journalism Network and in partnership with Harkin and Trusting News, we have worked with dozens of newsrooms over the last several years to actually implement this in their practice. And um, we have three newsrooms that are shining examples of how this is done. Um, obviously, this is a great template, but applying it is going to be different in every community and every market. And so we have um, Natalie here from uh, a reporter with KUNR in Reno, Nevada, um, to talk about how this implementation has gone for KUNR and um, and um, to share some insights and what she's learned. And then again, we will be able to answer everyone's questions um, after we do our brief presentations. So Natalie, um, please take it away. Thank you, Jessel. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. All right, how's that coming through? Jessel, look good? Looking okay. good. Perfect. So as Jessel mentioned, I'm Natalie Van Hooser. I'm a bilingual reporter working in English and Spanish, as well as a community engagement coordinator for KUNR Public Radio. And for our international audience, KUNR is part of the NPR National Public Radio member station network of public radio stations around the country, which are donor supported, they're listener supported. So that's the context where I'm coming from. And I am based in Reno, Nevada, which is the northern part of the state of the Nevada here in the U.S. on the West Coast. And we're serving a large Spanish speaking community, a large Latino community. So that is why my reporting is in English and Spanish. Now we're going to look at a few examples of how I have implemented some of these strategies that Jay talked about as far as citizens agenda reporting as part of the Advancing Democracy program with Solutions Journalism Network and Harkin and Trusting News coordinated by Jessel here. So for the 2022 midterm elections here in the U.S., I put together this candidate survey on the environment, and I'll walk you through the process of listening that led to that guide and then how that was useful to voters. And my slides here just go over some helpful tips to think about as you look at how to practically implement what you'll be learning in the webinar today and during the course with the Knight Center and the Solutions Journalism Network. So the first piece of advice I can give you is give yourself sufficient time to collect your questions from your community. Make sure that you have, in our case, it was useful to have six months to collect these questions running up to our midterms. And we did that digitally. And then as an iteration for, for future reporting, I moved that to in-person co question collection, which I'll share with you as well. But to give this specific example, for six months, I ran a Harkin form, which is a question submission form, asking community members in both English and Spanish what questions they had for candidates running in our local midterm elections here in Nevada, which included our city council, our mayoral race, as well as the county commissioners. So we were looking at local level as opposed to state level races. And with that, I received 30 responses, which was pretty good considering it was our first attempt at this. And out of that, I noticed that 40% of responses had to do with environmental concerns. So in our area, we often have to deal with wildfires and poor air quality as a result of wildfire smoke. And because of that, people were asking questions about what are you going to do pr to protect our vulnerable populations if you're elected to these offices and we have poor air quality? How are you going to help them? Another question we got related to water sustainability. We live in the high desert here and water is a scarce resource. So that was another main question that kept cropping up. And when you give yourself enough time to collect questions, you then start to see trends that you might not have noticed otherwise. So that's how I landed on focusing this candidate survey on environmental questions. Then from there, I took that topic to a focus group of students at the University of Nevada, Reno, which is our public university here, and specifically asked them what environmental questions they had for candidates. So total, I collected 50 responses, 
And then I was able to create this guide, which had three questions, one about air quality, one about water sustainability, and one about climate change in general. And then I took that to the 20 candidates running in local races here. I received 11 responses, but I made sure as a journalist doing my due diligence to make contact with all of the candidates. So in that guide, I included responses from those who did reply, and I also put a mention of who did not reply and why they chose not to, whether they told me they thought it didn't have to do with the office they were running for, or if they didn't understand how this question applied to them. I included that information so that all of that went to voters ahead of going to the polls. They could see how these candidates felt about these issues that our community, their constituents had clearly posed as concerns. So that was an example. We had digital publications, which were broken down by race that are on KUNR.org. We'll share the links for those. And then we also had radio stories in English and Spanish recapping the results of this survey. So that's one example of how to create materials for elections. As we've continued to experiment with this, I've also come up with a few other tips, which I'll spend a little less time on. Um, we've definitely seen the value of expanding this question asking process to in person as well as digital. I really wanted to reach more Spanish speakers in our community and doing it digitally just wasn't getting the amount of responses that I was looking for. So when we table at events like you can see here, our whole station, whoever's manning our booth is asking people to submit their questions. And then we have that on a little half piece of paper. People can jot them down right there, leave their contact information. It's a really simple process. And with that, you can start to see what larger questions people have if you're not just focusing it on one topic. And that led us to do some content related to transparency about our media organization. Because for a lot of people, when they started to write down their questions, it had to do more with does your radio station offer music? Like, where do I find your reporting on education or climate or politics? So as a result, I also created content about our station, not just about these topics. And that was a FAQ answering those main questions about what is our radio station, as well as a content guide for people to find reporting by topic. Because we're doing a lot of work, they just might not be finding it if they're not listening at the exact right time, etc. So this guide helps direct them there. Another tip is to take those topics that you've listened about with the community and do solutions-oriented reporting. I took that idea of reporting on air quality that we heard about in that survey process, and I did two stories about what's being done to monitor air quality, both in urban and rural areas here. So look at solutions journalism. I know you'll learn about more that more in your course. And engage with your community on the platforms that they use. We have a WhatsApp newsletter in Spanish, which has been a space for me to share our reporting, as well as share question submission forms, whether that's Harkin or Google Forms or something more simple, and collect questions that way. As well as experiment with Facebook Live events, which are a good space to get questions from your community in real time and direct them to a local expert at the same time, which allows you to cut out the journalists filtering the information for people. So we found those to be expect effective strategies and keep iterating, right? We did an FAQ just recently about the confusion related to our primaries, which we have election day today for presidential preference primaries here in Nevada. So this breaks down where people can go for their information. So thank you. A uh, big round of applause for Natalie. And to be very clear, Natalie, this was years of work by you and your newsroom, but that really shows what is possible um, and how these skills that we're talking about build upon each other. And Natalie went through a lot, um, you know, talking about uh, surveys, talking about using that information to, um, to conduct solutions journalism to um, how to make um, an FAQ uh, for you know, so that you can inform the public about how you're doing things and why you're doing things. And if you're interested in any of that, um, you know, stay tuned for the invitation to our online course through the Knight Center in April, because we'll walk you through all of those steps. And thank you all for those excellent questions. We will try to get to as many of them as possible. But again, this session will be recorded. 
and you will get all the materials we go over today in your inbox after this call. I wanna turn it over to Elliot Wade, who is a community reporter at The Current in Lafayette, Louisiana, um, another graduate of the Advancing Democracy Fellowship and um, a newsroom that has been using these skills for years now. So again, these, these are the sustained efforts of, of um, you know, dedic dedication from journalists and from newsroom leadership, which we know is um, really important in, in getting uh, results in this approach. But Elliot, um, please, uh, thank you for joining us and please take it away. Hello, everyone. Let me do the technology thing and try and get my screen shared. Uh, one moment. All right. How's that looking for everybody? We can see it. Thank you. All right. Perfect. Um, thank you all again for joining us today. Jay did an excellent job of outlining the steps necessary to engage, um, to engage your audience and to enact the citizens' agenda model. Um, for, enough, for election coverage. So I just wanna drive home the point that this is possible and that this model is worth investing time and energy into. And I'd argue that it might be even necessary for the future of, of journalism. Um, so a couple of key, the biggest challenge that we had was of course, just getting the audience engaged. Um, one of the things that uh, Natalie also echoed was having a, uh, a multi-tiered approach to getting folks input. So we had a three-pronged approach. We used our mailing list, uh, social media, and in-person events to solicit feedback. Um, the audience that we chose to focus on is young people. And through those various different um, various different ways that we garnered their input, we got over 500 responses. And we also were able to condense their um, main concerns uh, into three <laughs> topics that we touched on throughout the course of our election coverage. And that was housing, housing affordability, availability, uh, quality of life, jobs, et cetera, uh, and flooding. Louisiana is very prone to flooding, especially Lafayette. Uh, our infrastructure is a bit outdated. So that was another issue that folks were um, really keen on getting answers to. And we followed up on those concerns, right? We closed that loop and we created solutions oriented stories that answer some of those questions and then ask candidates about what they plan to do if they are in office. Um, and we use that input to create a candidate questionnaire in addition to the election guide we put out every year. So this is uh, just a social media video that was recapping one of the in-person events we did to solicit feedback, uh, teasing another in-person event and um, yeah, so that's that's a little bit about how that got going. We used our candidate questionnaire and we were able to get a, a fair amount of responses from candidates. The majority of candidates running for some seat, whether that was a, a council seat, um, the school education board, um, all the way up to the race. Uh, we, we got a lot of responses from candidates and it established a little bit of um, you know validity in us. We had a contentious relationship with the last mayor president, um, but he still saw value in the work that we were doing, and he couldn't ignore it anymore. Um, we from that we held a an event called Listen Up, using our candidate questionnaire, and the candidates had to sit back. Right, they had to listen to their potential constituents, listen to their concerns, their thoughts, their ideas. Um, instead of having them have the platform and be able to, you know, talk at folks. Uh, and that we got a lot of really good feedback from that event. And here's just a, a screen cap of, you know, some of the follow up we did on social media, re-reporting, you know, uh, the stories we did and our candidate questionnaire that just touches on some of those three main topics again. We noticed that housing had the most momentum for young folks. And in closing that loop again, uh, we gave some solutions oriented journalism and told people about what our local government can do to impact housing availability, uh, housing density, and even housing affordability. Uh, and that work directly influenced the candidates, right? They had to respond to what they were going to do about housing pro projects. 
And notably, it made it all the way up to the new mayor president, right? Um, our solutions to journalism surrounding these issues has become potentially viable solutions. We put out a story highlighting that there were issues with the zoning laws in Lafayette, that if we uh, decreased the minimum lot sizes, that we would be able to increase density. And now the newest mayor president, um, or just mayor, we have a very interesting local government, <laughs> but now she has to answer for that. She has to report back what she plans to do with housing. So lessons learned, just echoing Jay's Jay's um, <laughs> Jay's presentation earlier and what Natalie has done, uh, diversify your approach. Meet people where they're at. You know, we uh, had in-person events. We even went on campus a couple of different times. Um, we leveraged other social media pages in addition to our own. Um, yeah, also, if you write about topics that young voters care about, they will pay attention. Um, getting folks input, I, you know, it seemed like no other news organization was really... Um, investing in young people in the same way uh, throughout the election coverage. And that had a lot of value for young voters. Um, also having a community partner was incredibly helpful, especially in hosting election related event. Um, a lot of politicians were a little bit nervous about engaging with us. Um, we've been known to ask very hard questions, but we had a local um, leadership organization called the 705. And through their partnership, it allowed a little bit of that fear to be mitigated um, from politicians. It just made them feel a little less like it was a contentious thing to engage with us. Um, and the impact that it had on our newsroom, it increased brand awareness, right? We, I looked at just our social media following as, um, you know, as a metric and it increased. That in addition to our newsletter, we had um, a lot more young people trust us and view us as a credible source for election coverage. Um, it also got to connect the dots for voters, right? So it gave them more information about what actions they can take to echo their concerns to their local government. Um, and it made the politicians care about those things. The, your constituents had questions and had concerns, and you are now forced to address them. Um, and moving forward, it's shaped what we've covered and how we've covered it. I This was a transformative experience for me personally um, because I got to see an administrative shift, right? This is, um, I'm fairly new to the Lafayette area. I'm, you know, from Louisiana still. Uh, but I got to see the the pace, the, um, the energy around the mayoral administration shift because of the reporting that we're doing. Um, yeah, and that is all that I have. Fantastic. And um, yeah, again, um, you know, fantastic work, Elliot. Um, and, you know, that presentation is a testament for, to the years of hard work that the current has done to really implement and bring these, um, you know, these, this strategy to life and actually um, make some significant gains. As, as you, you know, as you mentioned, we know that news avoidance is a huge problem across the world, especially in the Europe, Europe in, in the United States, and doing this in, doing something different, actually listening to your community in a meaningful way and giving them the information they need to be informed has positive results. I know it may come to a shock to a lot of people, but um, Elliot, I appreciated you touching upon um, solutions journalism because you know I work for Solutions Journalism Network. I do a lot of solutions reporting and, um, and we know that um, that can be a powerful accountability tool because you're you're not letting candidates get off the hook by saying like they are you know they're doing something they're doing the best they can you're actually interrogating whether we're interrogating what the best practices are what's working and what isn't and so that takes us to our our next uh, panelist Hugo Balta who is the uh, who's the publisher at Latino News Network and also an accredited solutions journalism trainer. And additionally to that, also hosted a Knight Center webinar last year that we'll link to about solutions reporting and how to, how to add solutions reporting to your practice. Hugo, um, thank you so much for joining us. And, and so you also, um, your newsroom also took part um, for the last two years now um, in this Advancing Democracy Fellowship, where we put all these skills together. 
And um, so I want you to talk a little bit about um, what approach this had, like where, you know, where you were going from and where you are or wh where you started and where you are now, the, the from and to in terms of um, how your approach, um, you know, your mindset and your strategies to covering these issues, how that's changed over the last few years. Well, first of all, thank you very much for, for inviting me to participate in this very important uh, conversation. And, and to, to add to what's already been said, I think um, the key to success is collaboration. And when I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment, um, part of my background of more 30 plus years in not only includes the independent journalism space, but also legacy media. Um, I've had... Um, the great fortune to work for networks like NBC, ABC, CBS, and Telemundo. And I certainly can share uh, insights in, in regards to um, the, the changes that, that are needed in order to fulfill our jobs as journalists. I think for, for me as a journalist, as a publisher of the Latino News Network, it, it did start with a, a fellowship with Solutions Journalism Network, as Jazelle mentioned, and also being part of um, uh, Democracy uh, Now, Democracy SOS, you first have to kind of a little bit uh, unlearn what you have learned, you know, and, and question why are things uh, the way they are, you know, the, the systems that are in place from, from story ideation to pitching those stories to eventually packaging and delivering those stories. And I came across as a, as a, a person of color, a journalist of color, sometimes very often, either the only Latino in the newsroom or the only person of color in the newsroom, I really often kind of uh, started to hit this wall of, it, it's not speaking to me uh, as, a, as a member of a marginalized community. So we have to question um, the systems that are in place because they're often part of, they're, they're systems that were, did not have us in mind. And when we participate in uh, the Democracy SOS Fellowship, the first thing was to question how, how do we cover elections and, and politics? And it was very much a drawn from an antiquated way of, of covering uh, elections, which really served more as a, uh, a pulpit for candidates and and uh, parties and government, as opposed to what we really set out to do as journalists, which is to, as it is in the United States, our constitutional responsibility to give voice to the voiceless, to provide, um, to hold the powerful accountable. So the, the first shift um, was to change the newsroom culture of one that was very much caught from the cloth of the status quo and how elections were covered to really saying, well, why do we cover it that way? And is that the best way to cover elections? It was really a top-down approach. It was coming from, we're the journalists, we're, we're the ones that have the experience. This is, you know, we are providing what you need to know um, in regards to an election, as opposed to what really needs to happen, a bottom-up approach that as other um, guest panelists have talked about starts with listening instead of assuming what our audience needs from us our readers our listeners our viewers it's at it's listening and asking them what do you need from us at the latino news network and start to seeing them as not just a, a, a member of the audience but really as contributors in in helping us produce the content that is not only informational it's educational and it's empowering. Now, as our, you know, as our name alludes to, we're very hyper focused. We're serving the Latino community for, um, first and foremost in English. And a lot of times, um, when I meet people, they they go, "Well, wh why English, and why not Spanish or solely Spanish?" We do some bilingual reporting as well, and that's because we have to chip away at pre existing. Um, uh, biases about Latinos in the United States. Overwhelmingly, the approach to covering Latinos has been in Spanish. And there's certainly a need for that, given the, the overwhelming number of Latinos in the United States whose 
who say that either their their first language is Spanish or that they speak Spanish. But when you look at the census in, uh, reports, um, increasingly, the number of Latinos in the United States are not foreign born. They're U.S. born and English is their first language. But like so many marginalized communities, they're absent in regards to the reporting that happens in mainstream media, very much in regards to what we see with African-Americans, women, members of the LGBTQ community, indigenous people, just to name a few. So our focus is on Latinos, beginning with Latinos that are U.S. born. And that's because, again, the one dimensional narratives that, that happen in mainstream media is always from the perspective of a foreign born Latino, um, which is a, a, a falsehood. But also um, it's with a, it, the person that is producing that content is not a member of the community. So it's always from from a lens that is not from a member of the community but um, sort of looking into, peering into that community. That's why it was so important for us um, in, in regards to how do, how do we fit into the, uh, not only independent news uh, ecosystem, but news in general. How do we add value? Listening to our audience was so important. Understanding that they need to be more than just um, observers, readers, listeners, but really help us fine tune what that content is. Part of that unlearning what, what we've learned was also about understanding that you don't have to go at it, at it alone. Um, we certainly have fewer resources than many uh, news outlets and not just in mainstream media, but in the independent space. We don't have to re, you know, reinvent the wheel it's about being selective and partnering with others and not just news outlets, but organizations that intersect with our mission and look to collaborate. So we have worked with Be The Ones, which is, a, which is an organization that helped us um, shape uh, our, our voter guide, um, informational guide, guidebooks, and also helped us reach a larger audience We've partnered with schools of higher education and drawing from the work that they're doing with student journalists and, and giving greater visibility for that work. We're constantly looking to reach a larger audience organically as opposed to seeing, uh, beginning with and, uh, fellow journalists as competitors. When we stop seeing, uh, when we stop seeing others as competitors and seeing them as um, uh, members extensions of the of our newsroom we really started to not only reach our, uh, a higher audience but we also helped them produce much more dynamic reporting when it comes to uh, not just elections but in general covering the latino community and when it comes to elections the last point that i want to make is we stopped covering politics we stopped covering elections we started covering democracy because what our, our, our audience told us, and this is true, I'm a, I'm a second generation Latino, the proud uh, son of, of, of immigrants from Peru. The, as we see in, in every four years, or really every year, um, but when we, we talk about the general election, the increasing number of Latino voters, that, that Latino electorate, the Latino vote, you're talking about new voters that are U.S. born, that whose parents are coming from countries where the political system is different. And in some cases, there is a distrust with the political system, as well as uh, naturalized uh, citizens, uh, people that are uh, that are foreign born that become U.S. citizens. And so what they need, what they said that they needed from us was really to learn about the process of the election about the different um, uh, candidates that are running. And, you know, we were in a, in, a, in a presidential election year, they're the marquee, but it's about state and local government and, and um, uh, demystifying, for example, what the clerk of the circuit court does uh, and not just the mayor and why that it's so important to understand the work that those elected officials do because of how it impacts local communities. So. We not only cover, of course, elections, 
but we certainly cover what happens after in between those elections and and in doing so um holding the the elected officials to the work that they promised to do um so as as jay mentioned as natalie mentioned and elliot mentioned it is a living document right what you know that what, what jay went through it's not just a one and done but using that um those elements in your reporting daily and and actually integrating it into your daily uh newsroom meetings when you're pitching story ideas uh, when you're doing follow-ups and also using it as a measure of success in how you're doing uh, as a journalist and producing stories. Thank you so much, Ugo. And, um, you know, again, we will link to your website and um, the materials that everyone has shared along with the recording um, um, afterwards. And so there is a few, um, you know, a few things that were raised that were really important. My colleague, Tina Rosenberg mentioned, you know, I, I keep mentioning the years of hard work that you guys have all put into this, but people don't have years, right? This is an election year, massive election year in the US um, and in 60 countries, um, some have elections in the next few weeks that they wanna cover differently. Um, let's do a quick lightning round. What are some tips that each of you have for folks that have limited schedules? We heard from someone who's working in a very small team, um, as, as some of you do, what are some tips to get this process rolling now I mean, as Hugo mentioned, this doesn't end with election day, but to get this process started, um, Jay, let's start with you. Oh, Jay, you're muted, sorry. There you go. The first thing that I would do is ask ourselves as a group, what is going to be the model for election reporting we follow if we do nothing new or nothing different? And once you've paraphrased that and you're able to describe what would happen in a normal um, uh, election campaign without intervention by any of these ideas, it should be pretty obvious how you can take that uh, default uh, model and improve it just by listening. Even if you just listen to five voters, you're going to do better than horse race reporting. So that's my... That's my uh, clever uh, secret method is first get your staff to state what its existing model for election coverage is. And I think what will happen is people will find there's a lot of problems with that and we can do a lot better. Thank you. And journalists um, often think that they know they know what the community wants and by that simple act of listening they can actually um, bring credibility um, to those to those those the things they they think that the, the community wants, or or they can learn something new and and learn something different. Um, Natalie, yeah. So I'm coming from a small newsroom. I'm part time at KUNR, and they're full four time four full time reporters. So coming with that perspective, I would recommend that you start doing this community listening by having it running in the background if making it your primary focus isn't always possible because you have daily news to cover, right? So you can do these online question submission forms and just have them on your homepage, sp sporadically put them on your social media. And we've done our in-person listening when there's a community event where we're going to table. So we haven't put together a full in-person event just to get these answers. So have that going while you're doing your other reporting. And then I'd recommend just picking one of these things to try out at a time. You know, try a solutions-oriented story. There's step-by-step -step guides on how to do that. Try a Facebook Live event. Don't feel like you have to do all of these things at the same time. Pick one, see how it goes, and go from there. Thank you, Elliot. Yeah, um, I, I'll sort of just echo what Jay said and um, do some internal work first. Uh, I think one of the, the first steps that we did, and mind you, The Current is the only independent nonprofit news organization in our, you know, in our circuit. Um, but we also are an incredibly small team. Only this year we've gone to having five employees. Um, so I'll just echo that. It could be done with a limited, you know, limited manpower, so to speak. Um, but yeah, just get everybody on board and establish what, how you want to move forward in this election. Um, starting from that base, we also had, you know, the public hold us accountable. We made it open 
uh, for anyone to see what our election coverage was going to be, uh, what was important for us, how we were going to move from that point, and what we wanted to provide to the community. Um, and again, what Natalie already said was get the ball rolling, even if it's in the background. Um, <laughs> someone, oh my God, uh, Sierra Hinton, I, I can't believe, I, I can't remember if I'm remembering, but correctly, but she gave us some great advice, which was just try, right? Like <laughs> literally just throw things at the wall and see if it sticks and you can end up with some really amazing results. So just, you know, hit the ground running, put out one survey, make a Facebook post um, or, you know, get a WhatsApp group going. And something you also mentioned in your presentation, Elliot, is just the need for transparency. And to let let the audience let let your audience know that hey we're trying something different, we have limited resources, but this is a start. And you know, hold us accountable to listening and to do better. And I think that will that those sort of steps go a long way in building back the trust that has uh, that it's been lost. Uh, Jay, I see you raising your. I see you. Yeah, I just wanted to add just um publishing the following message. We're getting rid of the horse race. We're de-emphasizing the horse race and start and trying something different. Just that to change your coverage. Hugo. Well, look, just to, to, to reiterate, and you said it, transparency is so important. How do you build trust with the audience? You build trust with the audience by being transparent. One of the things that we learned, uh, again, with, uh, with the SJN fellowship was to to produce a mission statement uh, specific to how we're covering, we're changing how we cover elections to covering democracy and publishing it um, and, and sharing it with our audience. You know, Natalie mentioned making sure you have that up on your website. You, in order, not everybody, it's not about trying to please everybody, but people, the, the audience, the public will respect you as long as you're transparent about how where you stand and, and what your approach is. And then that becomes the litmus test in your reporting, what you point to every single time when you're pitching ideas to executing. Did we did we fulfill our mission in in cover and for us in covering democracy? And then lastly, there's a, a I remember forever talking about the voice of the voter, right? We want to to go to the candidates and be and, and lend our platform um, to elevate the voices of the voters. Well, with social media, what better tool to utilize? And, and we have to think about how, how are we engaging in social media? If so, if social media is only being used as a met, as a marketing tool, then you don't understand social media and, and how it, it could enhance your reporting. A lot of our, our resources is focused on producing native content, so uh, one-stop shopping for for our coverage, understanding the nuances between Facebook, Instagram, um, uh, uh, X, to name a few, and understanding that the audience is going to social media as one-stop shopping for to, for their news, information, and entertainment. So it can't just be a mechanism of of trying to get them to our stories on our website. It's also about producing content and how and where they consume it. And then utilizing that same platform to see them, to hear them and, and integrate that into our coverage so that when we're talking to a candidate about specifically what the community is asking for around economy, education, health, we can actually say this person from this neighborhood has this question and it's drawing from what they're sharing with us, engaging with us through social media. Um, there's a question I think specifically for Elliot, but I think you all may want to um, answer. And it was, how do you know that your efforts, and you you already answered this in the chat, but I wanted to, I wanted to emphasize this. How do you know what you're doing is working? Um, yeah, in in response to specifically um, how we know the candidates were running with our election coverage, we were <laughs> we have them on record, like verbatim, almost quoting our stories, right, or bringing up the solutions that we first echoed um, and elevating that along, you know, the course of their campaign trail. Um, I don't know if any of them gave us credit <laughs> specifically, but we knew internally that it was our work that led to that. 
Um, and also we, we were able to put on our own event where, you know, candidates were there. Um, but we, we garnered a lot of, a lot of responses from folks too. So, oh, another thing, the candidate questionnaire, we asked the majority of the candidates running for office. Um, and I'll say roughly maybe like 65 or 70 percent of candidates running for some seat locally uh, responded to our questionnaire. So we were able to have that on our website. Um, and it was a way for voters to hold them accountable as well. Uh, if one candidate from this district responded to these questions about housing, quality of life and flooding and another candidate didn't, that was really telling for voters. Um, I would like to also address that question. Um... The question that I recommended you use to inquire with your community about what they want the campaign to be about is, what do you want the candidates to be talking about as they compete for votes? It doesn't say, what do you think are your top three issues or which political footballs do you want to throw around during the campaign season or which prefabricated hot button issue meant to uh, divide one population from another uh, is yours. Uh, and so the more open-ended question of what do you want the candidates to be talking about means that they can tell you anything, even if it is not formulated yet as an issue, even if it's not on the minds of the pollsters and the existing um, speeches of the candidates. And so when you hear something that is has not been a part of the campaign dialogue, and it becomes part of the campaign dialogue because of your coverage, you are winning at election journalism. And you'll know it because the candidates will understand, they will see evidence in their own way of demand for that question to be answered. Fantastic. And Natalie, I know you uh, wanted to chime in. Yeah, well, part of looking at the candidates to see what's working is I noticed when we did things like our candidate survey on the environment, I got a higher response rate from candidates because everything was framed as these are questions coming from your constituents. It's not just coming from my newsroom. And then they see how it's in their interest to then get answers back out to those potential voters, right? So there's that piece. And also something that we've learned through iterating is that it's helpful to then with your listening loop with the community to know that your reporting's working, ask them for feedback on the reporting that you've produced too, not just at the outset of creating that reporting. And that'll give you some helpful ideas on what's working, what's not, and what has impacted them. So, you know, having those question submission or comment forms afterwards in a way you can moderate is helpful. And this is part of a, um, you know, an engagement loop where you ask your community, you do reporting, and then you go back to them and let them know what you found. And then you have, um, by getting their additional responses, you have material for more stories. You have built a relationship, you built trust, and you've had you've created a way for your audience to hold you accountable to what you've promised to do. And um, as you've heard, there's been tremendous success um, implementing these policies um, in the in the newsrooms we're talking about, and dozens more across the country. And we will send you. Um, more resources on that information. And then you can learn more um, through our MOOC, which will take place in April. And you will, if you're signed up for this, you will get the, uh, you will be the first to know when the registration for that is open. Uh, Ugo, I wanted you to respond to that question as well. And we're almost out of time, but we're hearing a lot of questions about misinformation. And how do you, uh, you know, we just have a, a couple minutes left, but not only are we in a time in, in, a, in a media, um, you know, in a space where democracy is at threat, um, journalism is in crisis, but we also have this massive problem with misinformation and, you know, maybe connected to a decline in trust in media, people are, are you know, uh, people are embracing things that are not true and, you know, those and informing themselves with uh, through resources that are not evidence based. So uh, not, not an easy question to answer in just a minute, Hugo, but give it a shot. Uh, yeah, look, I, I think um, an informed consumer is a, a good consumer. So I think the more that we can do to educate to educate the public about being responsible for the content that they're consuming is really important. You know, we we don't want them to be 
um, we want them to be an active participant in in how they consume news and information. So um, we we are absolutely open for their feedback, and we we are proactive in asking them for their feedback, um, responding to it in many in, in, in largely through social media. Um, but I, I think with a lot of the misinformation, especially driven through social media, uh, misinformation that happens, it's really about um, chipping away in regards to what that information is and where it's coming from and dispelling a lot of what could be rumors. So we do, uh, from time to time, host community conversations largely through uh, digital platforms like Zoom in order to continue to listen uh, to to our to the public but also using that as a platform to hey you might have heard this or you might have read this about a particular topic especially during the elections when we see a lot of bots that are are have are just feeding misinformation and we take part not only in chipping away at the misinformation but also provide them rev reputable um, sources including ours of course and others where they can fact check just like journalists fact check um, what public officials are saying. Can I add to that? Uh, when Absolutely. you put a, an issue or problem, an item on the citizen's agenda, you are in a way taking responsibility for that uh, problem to be placed in public dialogue. And um, the, the, the subject of misinformation is intimidating because there's so much of it coming from every side from every angle. And I think the citizen's agenda approach allows you to focus on a few priorities where you have the responsibility to point out misinformation, correct mistakes, correct lying. And you're that that's part of the beauty of this approach is that it tells you where to put your fact checking resources. It tells you which issues you have to actually perform on to be responsible to your community. I want to thank you. I want to thank our panelists for doing an incredible job. Um, if you're following the chat, there's dozens of people that that uh, that thanked you for your presentations and your thoughtful responses. I want to thank the Knight Center for hosting this conversation, the team behind the scenes. And um, again, everyone, this conversation is just the start. Um, Please be in touch. We will send you the recording. We'll send you the resources. We mentioned a lot of resources um, and websites. Um, Trusting News, Harkin, Solutions Journalism Network, where I work. We're all teaming up to create um, a webinar in April that you're all invited to join. And there's a lot more resources. We will be in touch with you. And uh, we want to learn. Uh, you know, the same way we're asking you to, to talk to your community, we want to hear from you. Um, and what other resources you all need as you're covering these dozens of elections around the world this year. So thank you, everyone. Um, have a blessed day. And um, yeah, and please be in touch. Thank you. Mm -hmm.